thank you so much. Uh, a couple of things that I want to say. I have been married uh, for uh, 22 years. I have three kids. So uh, in all those years of experience, I have had many, many dinners at home where people are eating and not paying attention to what I say. So please go ahead. I feel no guilty whatsoever. Uh, and also, you know, I'm, uh, you know, after David and, and Eric uh, doing the, their speeches, and they have such a great hair, and I have not, uh, that you know, that's why I wear a cap most of the time. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, is to talk about the Billion Prices Project, and, uh, and actually I want to show you our new baby. We have a new, new uh, a project uh, that we're doing. And, and indeed, a little bit what uh, Eric said is, um, my goal, I mean, we, we faculty are very arrogant, you know that. You know what I mean? We, we are genetically designed to be arrogant and obnoxious in general. So, um, but my personal objective is that I want to change the way statistical offices do their job completely. And I think that the procedures, how we collect the data, uh, the, the methodologies that we use, uh, have been designed you know, 50, 70 years ago uh, in the best of the cases. And, um, and most of those were designed with a particular purpose. It was to avoid manipulation. And the rules were very different from what the rules that we would like today. Um, also, technology has changed tremendously, and therefore, I think we can collect data differently. And so I'm trying to change the way we measure life uh, from the very personal aspect, uh, from uh, you know, how you measure your uh, self-awareness. Uh, a lot of the, you, and I have seen, you have these devices that we put on our wrist that measures the number of steps that you take and the number of hours that you sleep and the deep sleep, which is supposed to be very good. And, um, but these devices actually provide a lot of data. They're really lousy because they're not telling me if I'm healthier. They provide no information whatsoever. So the challenge that we have, that we're developing these technologies that are tremendously good at collecting data. We're not very good at actually providing better information. Uh, so that actually goes to my first slide. And, uh, and my hope is that we can marry these two. Uh, there are two types of data in general. Uh, people call it big data. I, I really hate uh, when you uh, uh, look at the data by their size. It's, it has nothing to do with big. I mean, the data on the census is humongous. Uh, but it's not a, the size is not what matters here. Uh, what matters is how the data was collected. Um, the data that we collect in a statistical office is what we call design data. It has a particular purpose. They are being collected to answer a particular question. When I collect the financial statements or your you know, uh, taxes, uh, you fill a lot of forms. Uh, if I were able to collect the data, that would be humongous data. Okay? It has a particular purpose, answers a particular question, which is what's your tax liability, and it lets the government to steal your money, sorry, to collect the money from you. Uh, we have these devices that are fantastic devices. I mean, most of you call this a phone, no? It's interesting because, you know, in Latin America, this will be called a cell phone. Uh, in, in Europe, it will be called a mobile phone. Uh, uh, so, an uh, iPhone. So, interestingly, they always use the word phone. You see, I think this is actually like a small computer with a lot of sensors that by accident makes phone calls. I mean, like how many times do you actually make a phone call with this stuff, you know? They actually are tremendous sensors that uh, look at you know, how we speak. They have our voice uh, 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 recorded there. So by the tone of our voice, I could tell if you are sad or happy or angry. Uh, uh, by, the, by your emails, I will know what your network is. So, so we have these devices that measure tremendous aspects of our life. We don't even know how powerful this is. And this data, we are generating this data without a particular purpose. We really don't know why we're generating the data. We don't even know we're generating the data. Every time you go to a mall and, uh, and you're in a store and you have your cell phone on, they are tracking you. And they know where you are. And they know that you stand in front of H&M, but then you didn't go to Bereksha. So that tells you something about the age of the person. And if you actually go to you know, Primark, tells me something about you know, you know, what the income level and stuff. And if you actually are standing on the back of the store, that means that you're looking at the sales. So you're probably a loser. So, it's a, it's kind of, you know, we actually infer a lot by tracking your phone. And, and the, we are not even knowing that we are, we are actually generating that data. There's an advantage of the, of the data generated by these devices. It's very cheap. It's very large. Uh, the access is usually quite open, especially in comparison to your tax records or your medical records, which will be impossible to get. Um, but there is a problem with that, is that it's not necessarily representative. 
It's a big aspect of that is that we're generating the data voluntarily. So if you want to stop to be tracked when you go to a store, you just have to turn off your cell phone. And there you will be, no, no will be tracked anymore. It's, a, it's kind of a decision. So it's not representative in that sense. And therefore, the conclusions that you get from the data have to take into account that the data by itself is not representative. If you treat this data as if it were the financial statements from the stocks, uh, from the companies that, that are in the stock market, uh, you will make humongous mistakes. I know more companies that have failed and go bankrupt because of misuse of data than companies that have been successful in the managing of data. And the reason, again, is that sometimes you're mesmerized by the data. Technology allows us to collect tremendous amounts of data. And the question is how we're going to use it. Let me give you an example. I think that today we write more words, sentences, and paragraphs than ever in the history of humankind. I mean, I have a horrible accent. So when I dictate uh, to the computer, it, it, it always tells me, you have a horrible Latino accent. Can you, can you type? No, that's usually what happens. Uh, but for, for some that actually speaks English correctly, uh, they, they, you, you can you know, dictate the computer, and the computer will just type whatever you're telling them. So we write a lot of words, more than ever before in the history. Uh, I can tell you, we don't produce better literature than 300 years ago. The fact that the words, the paragraphs, and the papers are cheaper to produce doesn't mean they are better. They are not necessarily better. And our challenge is to take these sources of data and make it information. That big gap between data and information is becoming bigger and bigger. And it's in the challenge of how we deal with the data and understand their limitations that will allow us to produce better information. And I think that that's, uh, that's part of what this initiative is about. Um, I have to put a disclaimer before I start. It's very important, this disclaimer, because when I say I, I mean we, OK? Uh, that means Alberto Cavallo and myself. Alberto is a junior faculty at MIT. He was my student uh, before that. Uh, also, very important, when I say we, I mean actually he, OK? Uh, so, or, or, or they, or, or somebody else, but certainly not me, OK? So, for example, in a sentence like, I am going to change the world, means Alberto and I. And when I said, we screw it up, it's Alberto, OK? And just, so, uh, what do we do? We, I, I want to show you two things that we have done. One is the Billion Prices Project, and the other one is, I call it, the Thousand Big Macs uh, Project. Uh, the first one is we, uh, we started by thinking about how to collect uh, uh, data from, um, to construct the inflation rate uh, in a better way simpler way, cheaper way. And, and that solves some of the issues that have a statistical offices. It is very common uh, for the statistical office that when they go to the store, uh, that the product is not found in the store. That the day they have to go, they go once a month, for example, in the United States, they go the Wednesday close to the 15th of the month. And they go to the stores physically, and they collect the prices. And in fact, it's almost like a clandestine operation. Is that OK? Because stores don't like. Uh, for people to take pictures of the items. In fact, you can do that. Go, and you worry, we are next to Oxford Street. Go down, turn to the right. After Tottenpole Road, you, there's a Primark on the right. Just enter Primark and actually get your phone and start taking pictures of the tags. You will see how fast you are going to be kicked out of the store. Is that okay? And in fact, a measurement of your cuteness is how long it takes for you to be kicked out. Is that okay? If you are really, 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 really good looking, well, you can spend like, you know, 50 pictures, okay? If you are ugly looking like me, after they see the phone out, they kick me out immediately, okay? So, um, but truly, it's almost like a clandestine operation in which they have to collect prices. Uh, they don't want the stores to know that the particular bottle of water is a very important item in the construction of the inflation rate of the UK. And the reason is, well, imagine if you know that I collect only 10 bottles of water in the whole UK. By the way, there are 10. And imagine that you know that you are one of them, and you know the brand that I'm collecting, and the day I come. You understand that you could affect the price of water? Now, in the UK, uh, we collect 69,000 items per month, so it's a lot. In Ghana, they collect 200 products a month, 200. So if you want to trade on bonds at the same time, you can, you know, you can make millions of dollars just by affecting the price of your item one day. Not only that, one afternoon, 
when the guy shows up. So, so truly, they want to keep this information uh, very uh, confidential. What we, now, the problem is that when they show up to the store, about 15% of the time, 15% of the time, the item doesn't exist. And they have a horrific procedures, I mean, they have a horrific problem because assuming that you don't drink water in London is a bad assumption, no? The fact that I didn't find it doesn't mean that you don't drink it. It's just that that day, in that particular store, that particular brand, I couldn't find it. So what we have decided was to actually go to online stores. We started getting data from online stores, first on food, and, and the first country we started was in Latin America. The main reason is that Argentina, the moment when we started, Argentina intervened the statistical office and they started lying about the inflation rate. It's very simple. The inflation rate used to be 12. Uh, the day after the intervention, the, the inflation rate dropped to 8, a little bit less than 8. And, um, and uh, it was very convenient for the government because the debt was indexed to the inflation rate. So by lowering from 14 to 8, uh, the interest payment just dropped by 6. I mean. They might be stupid, but they're not that stupid, no? So, so they, they realize they can make a fortune and, and lower the fiscal cost uh, of, the, of, the, of the debt. And uh, so the first country actually we started was uh, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and, and Colombia. Those were the first five countries uh, where we started. And a lot of this is because uh, we knew people in, this, in these places. Uh, when this project uh, started, uh, I call it the billion prices project because I had the hope that we were going to be able at some point in time to collect one billion prices a quarter. Today we have the ability to collect more than one billion prices a day. We track one billion prices a day. Uh, we can track, uh, yeah, and again, this is the ability of what we do. We don't necessarily have to do that. We actually do way less than that. Uh, but just these are orders of magnitude. We go to online stores first. We have to learn how to collect the price of a haircut. I don't know how many of you have ever gotten a haircut online, but it's kind of very difficult. Okay? I mean, the only haircut you can get online is actually this one. Is that okay? This is the haircut you get online. Except for this one, yeah, there's no haircuts online. But that doesn't mean that the prices are not online. You cannot buy gasoline online. Well, you can buy gasoline online. That will be mostly a terrorist webpage. But, but most of you cannot buy. That doesn't mean the price cannot be found online. Uh, so indeed, we have the ability to collect a lot of prices for a lot of services online. And when we learned to do that, we decided to start constructing inflation rates for different countries. Uh, these are all the places where we, co we collect data today. We don't collect on all the sectors. There are some countries where we collect, like the United States. The UK, for example, is one of the most fantastic ones uh, in our data in terms of the, 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 the coverage. And Venezuela, we used to have, but now there are a lot of problems. I am from Venezuela. There's a lot of problems right now with price controls. So we, a lot of the stores have disappeared. But give or take, we have from everybody. In India, for example, we will have food and electronics, but that's it. We don't have, we don't have all the sectors everywhere. But for the ones that we have, we construct inflation rates for those countries. And we can construct an inflation rate every day. Instead of going once a month, we go every single day. We have a basket that is incredibly big. The day the iPhone is released, I have an inflation rate of the iPhone the following day because I have two observations. That's it. Uh, uh, when the, the, I, the, the Apple Watch was released, actually, I am already collecting prices from Apple Watch from every web page in the world right now. Not a single one has been sold. And I already know for about a month what is the relative price of all the watches that they exist. So um, this gives an advantage of what we compute. Let me just show you some of the indexes. I'm going to talk about three things. One is the inflation rate, the other one is a true core, and, uh, and the other one is a Big Mac. The second one is a big conversation for central bankers. I just want to show you how different it is. I'm not going to entertain too much. But these are the inflation rates of some of the countries, the US, the Euro, Australia, and the UK. Uh, we started collecting these at different times, so not all the countries start on the same day. Uh, but, but you can actually see the orange line is our daily price index. The blue line is the official data. So in some countries, this is remarkably close uh, to the other. One interesting thing that happens is that online prices always move earlier than offline prices, always. And the reason is that, uh, try to remember the last time you purchased something online. Do you remember the price of what you purchased? In fact, let me do a, a, a raise of hand. How many of you actually purchased something online the last month? Raise your hand. Let's see. Like everybody. OK, do you remember what you purchased? If it's not an illegal item, can you share it with us? <laughs> uh, or not embarrassing? Two ninety nine. you know, remember. What was the price of that item a month before you purchased it? 
Isn't that interesting? You see, we have here a gentleman that, I mean, look at him. He, you know, he's kind of good looking, looks smart person, okay? Like you went to, yeah, yeah yes. And so he, uh, he purchased something and he has no idea if he paid too much or too little. He is memoryless. And by the way, every single online consumer in general is memoryless. You have no clue what the price of the item was a month before. And don't worry, there's only six and a half billion people like you, okay? But you know who knows that? The stores know that. The store knows that you have no memory. So if I have to increase the price of bread in France, to whom will you increase it first? To the guy that goes every day to the store or to the guy that goes online and has no clue? So you increase the price on the clueless. By the way, in France, they don't increase the price of bread. That, that happens like once every 200 years. Is that okay? <laughs> what, what they do, what they do in France is that they take the bread, and when there's inflation, they just make the bread smaller, 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 and that's how the croissant was invented. Is that okay? <laughs> that, that's, that's the procedure. And then when they, you have no other option, then, man, I have to increase the price. You increase the price, and they burn like 24 stores, okay? <laughs> the same happens in Italy with pasta, by the way. So, so because of this feature, online prices capture inflation way earlier. So we turn in the United States always moves about two months before the official data. In England, always moves about three months. In Australia, it's kind of, I mean, they produce one quarterly data, so it's kind of irrelevant. But we move it's five months before in Australia because of the frequency. And in the Euro, it's about a month and a half. We have other countries where they're not that identical. I mean, but I want to show you some emerging markets, Brazil, Colombia. Chile and China. I'm always asked about China if China is manipulating the data. In China, I can only produce, we, sorry, Alberto and I, we can only produce uh, an inflation rate for food. But we don't have that many sectors. Uh, but at least on food, uh, this is from 2009, there, there's not a big difference between what we compute and what the statistical office computes. I mean, they're roughly the same. The trends are very, very similar. And uh, here you can see the recession in Brazil. You see this decline, tremendous decline in prices? Well, that's going to be announced in about uh, a month and a half, OK? Yes. You saw it here first. Anyway, so now, but this is a country that we always have in our data. It's a country that now is used in the, in the iLab at MIT, because if you don't see the difference between the orange and the blue line, you are legally blind. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Argentina. Uh, always when I'm asked about a reporter, they ask me, well, this is how many years you have? I said, it's about seven years of data, OK? So in seven years of data, the official inflation rate is 220%. Uh, our inflation rate is just a slightly different. Just one different digit is 520. It's just, we just moved the wrong digit. Anyway, um, so some countries look like this. Okay, Some countries, the inflation rate that we compute is just dramatically different from the official one. And um, uh, Russia, Venezuela, right now, our inflation rate is twice what is reported uh, in, the, in, the, in the official statistics. Um, there are these two properties that I said. The first property is congruence. That means that for some countries, the inflation rate online is very similar to the inflation rate offline. And the good thing is that it's anticipation. This has actually changed a little bit the way central bankers look at our data. Some central bankers use our data to try to improve the short-run prediction of their inflation uh, uh, policies. And that's kind of the objective. The true benefit here is between the first three and six months. After that, there should be no, no, not any benefit uh, from our data. Let me just talk a little bit about uh, the core effect. Uh, almost every central banker in the world talks about the core inflation rate. I don't know if you have heard. But the core inflation rate is that they want to take out of the inflation rate the things that they are out of their control, OK? So for example, in the United States, and by the way, this will be true in almost every country, they said, well, we don't control the price of oil because I have no control on the price of oil. I have no control on the price of gasoline. There will be inflation rate up and down on gasoline. So what I want to do is to exclude gasoline from that index. And I always hated that procedure. Because I said, like, OK, so if you don't control the price of gasoline, then what about transportation? Because transportation is heavy on gasoline. And usually said, well, you know what? Yeah, maybe I should exclude transportation too. OK, but if you exclude transportation, what about imported items that they all are transported by the transportation that you wouldn't control? Well, yeah, maybe we should actually take out also you know, imported items. Well, about, what about services? Because the price of energy will be affected by gasoline, and that will affect every service of the country. 
So if you take this to infinity, you are left with two items. Two haircuts and prostitution. That's it. Truly, these are the only two that consumes a different form of energy. Okay? Except for that, I mean, so that should be a very easy core. And by the way, in Italy and in Netherlands, they have been collecting both for a long time. So they actually, they know. It's a much better procedure to eliminate the indirect effect. How much of the inflation rate of tomato depends on gasoline? How much of the inflation rate of transportation depends on gasoline? If you want to take out the, the effect of gasoline, you don't want to take the whole sector. You want to take only the part that is affected by the price of gasoline. And you know, uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, statistical procedure is very difficult to run when you have uh, very infrequent data. You need to have very frequent data. So the daily data made a big difference. And this is, for example, the core of the United States. I have been able to do this only for the United States. Uh, the blue line is, uh, is the official core. The orange line is the core that we have produced. So I just want to show you how remarkably close they are in normal times. But what happens is, for example, this year, when the United States, at the beginning of this year, was detecting very negative inflation rate, very negative outlook in the United States at the beginning of this year, all of that was the indirect effect of gasoline, affecting the sectors that they were not excluded. And, it's, uh, and in some sense, uh, the, by, the Fed, by the way, the New York Fed knows this perfectly. They know this absolutely perfectly. Some of the best researchers in the world at computing pass-through are in the New York Fed. So they know this. They, they, they know the effect is there. Just, they just cannot clean it out with the data they have. It's different. So you know the effect is there. Everybody can do the exercise that I just performed. They just cannot actually separate. And, it's, um, and they knew that so much that, that they were not mentioning to the world that the inflation rate was negative in the United States. And therefore, we were in a massive deflation, and we should actually be printing like crazy, according to all the Keynesians. Is that OK? Uh, well, they, they failed to mention that because they knew that the data that they were obtaining, the signal that was coming from the statistical office was not the correct one. And, um, and by the way, I expect these two lines to catch up with each other by June of this year. So by June, they will, should be uh, at roughly the same. So let me tell you about the 1,000 Big Max project. Uh, this is our new baby. This is the first place I'm presenting this uh, from MIT. So, um, what we did is, uh, because we have the same retailer around the world and we have the same products around the world, we decided to construct new measures of, uh, of uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, um, instability. Let, let me explain what it is. For many, many years, the World Bank, with a, a very big consortium with the United Nations, the IMF, the OECD, the Statistical Eurostat, they have a program that is trying to compute how much $10 buys you in the US versus London versus uh, Brussels versus you know, Beijing and versus a rural area in, in, in China. So the idea is this is known as the purchasing power parity. Whenever you see the statistics and you look at something that says GDP and then in parentheses says PPP adjusted, what they're saying is, well, the $10 in London buys you no, I mean like you know, one cup of coffee, OK? Uh, but $10 in India buys you a whole meal. So the idea is that the $10 do not have the same purchasing power. And therefore, what we want to do is to compare apples and apples, no? That's how much the $10 in India can buy. And this program has been running for many, many years. Uh, the data has its weaknesses, because when you go to Germany, they collect a beer that is different from the beer that they collect in Belgium, which is different from the beer they collect in Japan, which is different from the beer they collect in the United States. So even though it's beer, it's a different brand. And there's no reason why one should be the same as the other. In fact, in general, they are not. So for many years, they have been trying to, to get prices the same way. There was a brilliant idea by The Economist, the, the magazine, uh, where they decided instead of collecting all the prices to collect one item correctly. And they went to the Big Mac. And now they compare internationally the price of the Big Mac, which I think is a brilliant idea. There's no, I mean, we know that this item is bread, lettuce, and something that smells like meat. Is that OK? 
and it's the same recipe everywhere. It's hated by all the nations equally. We all consider that very unhealthy equally, so the price comparison. By the way, they are constructing two new indexes. One is about the, uh, the latte from, um, uh, from a Starbucks, uh, a tall latte from a Starbucks worldwide, and, and the other one is uh, an iPad. What is the cost of an iPad worldwide? So, so the idea is that that allows you for a price comparison. Well, in our data, we realize that I have SATA, and I have SATA in 82 countries. That means that I have the same T-shirt exactly in every place. And SATA sells about 4,000 products. Then I go to H&M, and H&M has the same T-shirt everywhere. I go to Nike, same. I go to Apple, same products. I go to Dell, same products. I go to actually all the tradable sectors, food, clothing, uh, personal care, um, uh, gasoline and, and things that close to uh, energy related. Um, uh, and, and we have all of them. We actually collected the data from all of them. So we were able to actually construct these matchings uh, from the world. And instead of having just one Big Mac, we have uh, several ones. So uh, this is the UK versus the United States. These actually are the pictures from my webpage. This is longer data. I'm just showing you starting in January of 2014 just to show you. This is one item. Uh, and when you look at one item, this, is, this tells me that the item in England was twice the price of the, of the American one. Is that OK? So this is the price in pounds divided by the exchange rate divided by the price in the US. OK? So I convert the price in pounds to dollars. And it's very interesting because this is how a Big Mac will look like. Well, sometimes it's very cheap. Sometimes it's very expensive. Now, it's very interesting that when you actually start putting more items in this list, uh, things change dramatically. This is one item. Uh, this is a different item. So this actually is cheaper in England. By the way, this is food. That is fuel, OK? Just to let you know. And this is supposed to be confidential. It's not like this is being broadcast on the web or something like that, anyway. So, <laughs> so this is actually a food purchased from the same type of supermarket. So this is comparing Tesco with an equivalent supermarket in the United States, which will be, for example, Safeway. Okay, same quality, same type of customers. So it just happens to be that this, this item of food is cheaper. But then when you put more and more items, you know, things start to be more convoluted. It's very difficult to understand what it is. And when you put all the 1,000 items, it looks like a very nice picture. And, uh, and you can clearly see a trend here. <laughs> if you don't see a trend here, then you have, you have problems in visualization. What we do is we take all these massive uh, set of uh, items. These actually are all the items, that, so I have no idea how many they are. I just, I, I'm always glad that Alberto has uh, a little tag at the top of that list, which says match IDs, that says all. And I just press all, and <laughs> whatever comes it is, is the number. And uh, what we do is we construct these indexes. And I just want to show you the difference. This is Brazil. Uh, and in fact, this has made a big difference for emerging markets. Um, not such a big difference for the UK yet, in the sense that I am not reading something very different from the statistical offices for the moment. But in a country like Brazil and Australia, this has been very dramatic. The blue line is the data constructed from the official, uh, from the official indexes. You take the official indexes, this is what the World Bank or the IMF will construct. According to that, uh, uh, Brazil is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper through time. OK, and this is actually not a small period. It's from 2012 to today. And you can see that I normalized at 100 at the beginning, and Brazil is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. If you go to Brazil, you will realize that actually that's not the case. It has it's no relationship with this. And the reason is that this has a very particular basket. This has a lot of domestic food. And therefore, you are comparing domestic food in Brazil with domestic food in the United States. Well, you are not even comparing the same items. When we actually do our tracking, today Brazil is about the same place where it was uh, three years ago. Um, in fact, I, we construct an overvaluation. You can look at the orange line if you want. There's two ways of computing overvaluation. Uh, but both of our measures will tell you that Brazil today is roughly in equilibrium. By the way, the recent devaluation, this is actually printed, uh, I, I, I think I sent this yesterday. So this is the data from yesterday morning, OK? So which includes, actually, the, the previous day. Um, so, um, so in some sense, uh, it's right about where it should be. Uh, and, and in fact, when you look at these periods on the orange line, those were the periods just preceded 
movements of uh, exchange rate uh, dramatically. Uh, this is UK. I just wanted to show you the UK. So if you look at the orange line, which is kind of my preferred one. By the way, the blue line is the preferred one by, for, for, uh, for Alberto. But Alberto is from Argentina, so he's always very negative. You see, he's always very far from equilibrium. As an Argentinian, he has never known what equilibrium means. Is that okay? So to find a variable that is close to zero is impossible to understand. So, but uh, but the, the top one, you know, I actually pay attention to the to the bottom one. Okay. So actually, the UK is roughly what it is, and it's uh, it's an interesting statement about uh, uh, about uh, the UK is that we are going to have a lot of volatility on the sterling uh, dollar and sterling euro rate due to the elections, and this uh, and this uh, uncertainty that we are going to see is going to be reflected on a very volatile uh, sterling rate, which already is happening. Now, interestingly, according to our data, this is coming from the retailers. You understand? I'm not doing anything sophisticated here. I just take the tomato in Tesco, and I divide the tomato by the tomato in, 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 in Safeway or Giants. That's it. Like, it's, wow, super sophisticated. This cannot be less professional. Is that OK? OK, so. so so our data is telling us that the retailers that are trading all the items in, in, in this, uh, between these two countries are telling us that the rate is about the right one. So maybe there is a lot of volatility, but there doesn't seem to be a very big trend here. Um, what is my goal? And let me just finish with this. I am, I am working a lot on retail sales and consumer demand. I am, uh, we have done uh, big uh, strides, especially Alberto, on supply disruption. So after an earthquake or a, or a flooding, to understand and measure better the economic impact of those natural disasters. We are working on employment and labor markets to try to understand demand. As a, little bit, a, a very important theme of the, of the digital economy is that this is going to change dramatically the demands for a skilled versus unskilled workers. And therefore, we need to understand where the holes will be and where the high demands, where the professions that are in high demand. And, uh, and finally, I'm working really hard on real estate and trying to get a daily measure of GDP. Um, some people say, like, what do you need to, to do this? It's, I always say, well, you know, I, I, I usually need, uh, like, uh, one billion prices. But, but truly, I think I need more than that. I need, like, one trillion prices, OK? And I don't know, but, you know, you can see the similarities. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me pick uh, these uh, questions. The, the question is how you develop the weights, or how you construct the prices. So uh, we cannot weight the, pri uh, the items by just looking at the web pages. It, it cannot be done that way. And in fact, I have spent about 15 years going to the stores. I arrived today in the morning to, to London at 6 AM. I took a shower. And the first thing I did was then take my train, Paddington, then Paddington to actually uh, Oxford uh, Circus, and I walk through Oxford Street. And, uh, and what I do is I go to the stores to try to understand what they are selling and how and what they are selling is shown on the web. Because it's the, how they present the products on the web tells me a lot what they are selling. Because when you think about it, they, if you go, and in fact, sometimes I have to buy things for them to tell me, OK, which I do. So my backpack was empty, and now I have like the two shirts for my daughter and candy for my wife. It makes it, so, th so they love this research that I do because, you know, I, I take all the money that I spend on all these materials and I give it to David because it's research, you know? So, so he pays for the research. And so we get uh, free clothing and free equipment all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but I have to understand that. And there's a big mapping. There, there are some stores that are very badly behaved that what they show you online is not what they are going to sell. And that's the part, the very important part of transforming this data into information. If you don't do that homework, eh, eh, you will make a mistake. Now, there are some honest, very honest web pages. So let me tell you some of them. IKEA, H&M, Sara, Apple. These are web pages that are exceedingly honest in terms of showing you uh, what they are going to sell. And roughly how they show you tells you a lot what matters. And that's, that's kind of uh, the way we do it. So it's store specific in that sense. And, and we have, so when I construct the price of tomato in, in the UK, it's not that I constructed one price of tomato. Actually, it's one per store. So Sainsbury will have a different index than Tesco and so on. And then I aggregate into tomato. And then a tomato, two lettuce. And then I put some bread and some bacon. Boo, BLT. Woohoo! Yeah, next item. And that's how more or less how we proceed. Another question. Yes? I don't think. Oh, great. Would these tools work 
equally well in a deflationary scenario versus inflation, because you've only talked about inflation so far. So uh, indeed, <clears throat> indeed, uh, so what changes between deflations or recessions and, and booms, what changes is how anticipatory is the online, okay? So for example, uh, when you have a, a massive recession, uh, usually what occurs is that prices tend to go down, and therefore the online prices go down a little bit faster than the other ones, but it will be a month, but no more than a month. And the reason is uh, <clears throat> now there's no reason not to lower the prices, you see? But if the price of bread is gonna be cheaper, consumers, if anything, uh, they're gonna be happier. So there's an issue with the timing. So on the, on the downturns, the degree of anticipation is a little bit smaller than the upturns. On the upturns, the anticipation can be three months. But yeah, that's the only difference. Now, I, I show you some data on the United States, and you can see the recession. We kind of picked the same deflation, uh, both of us. So, and, and, and the recent decline on prices due to oil, also, for example, in all the countries, look very similar to the statistical office. So in that sense, uh, it, it's the same. Now, not all the price declines are the same. For example, oil prices, when they decline, they decline very fast on both, both data, okay? Uh, but recessions that come from lower demand will be a little bit more anticipated on the online. But that's the difference. Good question. Yes. Hi, yeah. Have you looked at this in relation to more complex bundled product, like the way telecoms bundled your TV and your voice and your broadband and so on? It's very hard to separate out the individual elements. Oh, very good question. No, no I have not. So, so when I look at, for example, uh, you know, TV contracts uh, or, or, you know, internet and contracts that you will have for your home uh, electronics. Uh, and, uh, I actually, I just look at, at what is the bundle that they are selling. So I don't disentangle. It's a, it's a very good question, um, but no, I, I, don't, I, I have not paid attention to that. Okay, thank you. No, no? Yes. Uh, last question, actually it was more of a request. Could you please remove that, those pictures? They're driving people crazy on the web. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Roberto, very much. Appreciate it. Good. Thank you so much for everything.